Well, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for joining today. My name is Greg Kaplan, and I'm the author of Earning Admission, Real Strategies for Getting into Highly Selective Colleges. And I am a college admissions uh, advisor that helps students navigate this process. And uh, for some of the folks who uh, are in attendance, I have done this uh, a similar talk to uh, Coronado High School uh, in the spring uh, and last fall. And what I'd like to do today for everyone that is here is to talk about updates that we're seeing as it relates to college and what I think would be helpful for folks to think of as it relates to applying to college um, uh, in the years to come. So I see that we have uh, several uh, participants just to get a gauge of the grade levels that uh, that either you are in or, um, or the parent of children. Do you mind just putting in the chat uh, your grade levels? Senior, okay. 11th, okay. Just those two, that's fine, uh, if that's the case. Uh, but I, I definitely want to tailor this talk to those intended but applying next year. Okay, so we have seniors and 11th graders. So it seems like everyone it's in the, in, in the immediacy of uh, applying. So what I'd like to do then is one, briefly talk about how the uh, college admissions process works and then what I think would be relevant for current juniors and current seniors. So either A, you're gearing up to apply or B, are applying. Uh, so when the way the college admissions process works is it is when you submit your application. So if you're a senior and applying, and this is uh, if you're applying and say early action in, in November 1st or the UC is on November 30th, your application will go through a two step review process. The first step is going to be a review of your numbers. And this consists of your high school transcript and um, your high school transcript and ACT score. And if those numbers meet the academic requirements that the university has set for its applicant pool, then you move into the second round of this process where they're going to open up your application and they are going to read the essays and activity descriptions that you include inside the application to understand your ability to add value to a college. So this college application is a marketing piece. Now with the numbers, this is more relevant for folks who are not applying this year or who are seniors that will be taking a year off and then applying. But for if you're in grades 11 and down uh, in the start of a, a new school year at Coronado High or potentially another school uh, elsewhere in San Diego, is that if you have the, num the numbers this is the part of the process where, you know, admissions officers don't necessarily have the capacity to read every single application they receive. So they use numbers as a way to window down the applicant pool to something more manageable. Last year, UCLA received over 150,000 applications and they don't have the capacity to read all of them. So they have the luxury of saying, we're only willing to look at students or applications that have uh, one or two Bs in grades 10 or 11 versus a school like um, the University of San Diego may say, we're willing to look at students, which with a higher acceptance rate has the luxury of saying, well, we'll look at students that have nine or 10 Bs in grades 10 and 11. So when it comes to grades, the better one's grades are, the higher their likelihood is of moving into the second round of this process, which is based on uh, the story. So what I would say to people in grades nine, 10 and 11, or parents of students in grades nine, 10, 11, is do your best academically. There are 2,200 colleges out there in the United States where we, you can put together a list based on where you shake out academically. Now, COVID presented enormous uh, challenges to learning and not everyone did as well as they would have liked to have done. And so every college is indicating to people in the space that an upward grade trend in this year where we're hopefully going to stay back in the classroom for the entire year is that an upward grade trend for this year for underclassmen will be given weight in this process. So if remote learning wasn't your thing 
do your best to demonstrate your ability to thrive in more normal conditions. And my other recommendation to build a transcript if there was any hiccups during the pandemic would be to look for uh, community college classes online in the summers if you have time to do that uh, before you apply or look for other opportunities to demonstrate your ability to do well in more normal learning environments. Now, the other thing with the pandemic that's worth mentioning is that uh, if you are applying to the UCs or the Cal States, they are barred from using SAT or ACT scores as a factor for admission. Other colleges throughout the rest of the country are test optional, meaning an SAT or ACT score are, is, is not required in order to be admitted to one of these universities. And that is new. If you are a parent on this call or an adult, uh, we all know that we had to submit SAT or ACT scores to be admitted into four-year universities. That is the biggest change in this process. With test scores being optional, it used to be that the transcript and the test score were weighted 50-50 and evenly, that you couldn't have, say, like a 12.0 GPA and then a 400 on the SAT, meaning you just didn't even show up and care, or vice versa, that you're like, oh, I don't want to do my homework. I'm a straight C student, but look, I have a perfect SAT score. Admit me, Stanford. Uh, that is not the case of this. I'm just, yeah. looks like the lighting is a little... Is the lighting a little weird? I apologize if it is. Maybe I can... Uh, anyway, I'll just keep talking. Apologies if there's glare. I see it on my end. Um, with... Um, lighting is good. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. Um, sometimes you get a little self-conscious while doing these talks. Um, between the two now, the transcript now weighs much, much more heavily. And so this is another reminder to do your best academically with school and to be mindful early in the semester that we're, we currently find ourselves in to do the best that you can. So I would say if you're hoping that, gosh, we're going to go get a really strong SAT score to make up for grades, the transcript is weighted much more heavily now. And um, because it's the only thing that UCs are going to see. Now, if you're a senior applying to a UC or Cal State, there's no other test that you can take that they care about. The UCs for younger students have promised that they will develop a new, more fair test uh, to replace the SAT or ACT. I'm not holding my breath on that, and I wouldn't expect anyone else to be doing that as well. So um, the UCs for the foreseeable future remain test blind, meaning that there will not be an admissions test and that the only quantitative numbers they have to work with are your uh, high school transcript. And again, even if you're a straight A student, there were no hiccups in the pandemic, we are encouraging students we work with to take community college classes in the summer to provide additional data points to show your ability to thrive academically. And the cool thing about community college classes is sometimes they tend to be much easier than what you'd be taking at Coronado High, which uh, I think um, just makes you question <laughs> what kind of crazy world we live in where um, your, your kids in high school are being raked over the coals. But if they were to go take a class at San Diego City College, they may find it a little more user friendly, but um, not judging on that, uh, even though I have an opinion. Um, but uh, what I would say is that it's also an amazing opportunity to demonstrate academic interest. So not every high school, including, and I'm just speaking Coronado High, given that this is for Coronado Library, is that with a small high school, you don't have a million different electives that you could take in different fields. But for students interested in, say, uh, business, you could take so many different business classes at San Diego City College or Southwestern College. You could also take, let's say, someone's interested in architecture. Uh, you could take an intro to architecture class as well. So, and these classes matter when you're applying to a school uh, and trying to show demonstrated interest, which is part of the story, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, I got a little sidetracked from the SAT or the ACT, and I encourage anyone who has questions on things that I am covering, i.e. the transcript, to feel free to just ask me uh, through the chat and I'll try to incorporate into my talk. But um, with the SAT and the ACT, as I mentioned, the Cal States and the UCs are not accepting it. But with the first year of the pandemic, uh, it, or the first year of applying in a pandemic or post-pandemic world, depending how you see it, uh, is that 75% of students admitted to the most selective schools in the country that do accept scores. The USC's, the Stanford's, the Claremont Colleges, the Ivy's. 75% uh, of students that were admitted to those schools did submit test scores. And what we are seeing is that if you are an applicant applying from a community that has the time 
and resources to uh, sit for the test and study for the test, there's that expectation that you do have a test score. I'll speak a little more plainly and candidly to a Coronado audience. Um, admissions officers understand demographics for different communities and they understand which communities can invest in test prep. Um, I was telling Tara that I grew up on Coronado uh, from my early childhood, so I'm very familiar with the island. Coronado is a community that is expected to take the test for very selective schools because uh, just the, the demographics for, for parts of the island. Um, I know that doesn't apply to everyone, but it's the general view of, of coastal Southern California, whether that's Coronado, La Jolla, Del Mar, um, Laguna Beach, communities like that. So if you are a parent or student who is in grades you know, nine, 10 or 11, and you have your sights set on the, very, the most selective schools in the country, uh, I would encourage you to put yourself in a position to have a test score that is competitive for those schools because they will expect students in the Coronados of the world to have those test scores versus maybe in a San Ysidro, uh, they're not having that expectation. Um, if you are an underclassman and wanting to understand how to take the test, the best step to do is in the summer is to take a diagnostic SAT or ACT. You could download uh, free copies of the tests online through either the ACT or the, um, the College Board, which makes the SAT, or you could even make photocopies of the test books that are at Coronado Library that I've seen in the last couple of years as well. A uh, little shout out to Coronado Library. Uh, they have a fantastic college prep section that I have seen as an adult. Uh, and while meeting some of my students uh, at the library uh, pre-pandemic, so you can get copies at the Coronado Library. You can go on the website, take one of each, and you can see what your scores are, do it in simulated testing conditions. And um, you can compare the scores of both tests and uh, using what's called the concordance chart. And you see which one's a better fit. 80% uh, of students have a clear cut preference for one test over the other. And simply finding which test is a better fit for you can sometimes net up to 100 points on the SAT scale, which is back out of 1600 again. So picking the right test is the most important part of this. And then you can determine how to prep uh, based on whatever fits you know, your family's goals and, and needs and budget, whether it's online courses through Khan Academy or ACT Academy or um, working with a, a private tutor or a group class. Uh, for everyone who is on the, the call today, I'm going to put my our, our company's uh, email address uh, in the chat if you had a question on that um, or anything actually for that matter uh, you have that at your disposal uh, so um, I would recommend that now if you're a senior or a senior in applying next year um, I wouldn't worry about the SAT or ACT if you don't have a score at this point um, I would focus on writing the, the highest quality applications but this is more for younger students does anyone have any questions on the SAT or the ACT? That tends to be the biggest question I have uh, from families and feel free to put it in the chat. If you do, I will address it now or I will move on. Um, I think one thing worth mentioning just to give people time to ask a question is if uh, a lot of people do ask me and if you are currently enrolled in AP classes or your child is enrolled in AP classes, do AP scores matter? Um, AP scores are not weighed heavily in this process. AP scores are a reflection of how well the class teaches you to take the test. And there are wide discrepancies in AP scores between high and low achieving schools and even between the same teacher, between two different teachers at the same school. So I don't want anyone to be stressed about AP scores. They're not being weighed more heavily at the moment. And if you're a senior or a, or a junior and you're like, gosh, last year, uh, was a doozy with um, hybrid learning and just all the chaos that we experienced last year, don't worry about it. You don't have to report AP scores. Also at the library, there's also AP and uh, prep books as well, if you need them. Yes, we have lots of those prep books for you here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to the uh, the second part of this process, which is the more fun part, which is the story, uh, and um, and if you have questions on that, feel free to continue to to, to send them to me, and then I'll answer them at the end. 
Um, now let's say you have the numbers and whether that's, you know, you're, you're meeting the academic requirements for, um, and let, let me just add one quick thing about APs because that's a great question. Do you have to take the AP test if you're in the class? I know you don't, there's no expectation. So if you're in the class, just focus on getting a grade in that class. That was a great question. Um, now, let's say you have the numbers and you're an academic, you know, just superstar and you're sitting pretty with straight A's or you're, you're targeting different schools with a different, set of, with a different set of grades on your transcript. This is the part where grades and test scores no longer are the determinative or the outcome determinative factor for admission. And this is where they open up your application and they're going to read the essays and activity descriptions and they're going to make a determination of who adds the most value to a college. And the three key factors they're looking, if you're not writing a check with cold hard cash, I am, here's a $25 million donation to Stanford, like show my kid the red carpet, or you're playing a sport is the three key factors. And I'm guessing if everyone on this call today is logged in, that's not them because you wouldn't care about what I have to say, uh, is grit, leadership, and passion. Grit is your ability to overcome obstacles. And the way you demonstrate that is not necessarily by hustling, by playing, you know, three sports and hustling for balls and, you know, do morning practices and things like that. It's getting a part-time job because there's certain questions which are, that have been raised that I think are rightfully earned for, for many communities uh, about entitlement with kids or applicants these days. And what is mom and dad making possible in the background versus what is the applicant, uh, what is she capable of doing for herself? And so the way you dispel any notions of that is you get a part-time job at some point in high school. And because it's the one thing mom and dad can't do, which is bag groceries at Ralph's or Vaughn's. Um, I mean, although next time I do go to Ralph's, I would not be surprised if I see a parent helping their child doing it. So, um, and the other thing I'll say about this is that, you know, the life skills you gain from having a part-time job at a young age and learning that you're a low person on the totem pole, um, those are critical for success. And colleges recognize this, is that um, I always tell my students that the person I sat next to when I was a summer analyst or intern at an investment bank on Wall Street was the, the person sitting next to me. Uh, he went to MIT, I went to Penn. He was the most brilliant uh, intern in our class. And he did not have, um, he had never had a part-time job. He grew up in a compound in Aspen. And I was really used to just barking orders at people and having people wait on him hand and foot. So he did not understand what it meant to ask our group's administrative assistant if she needed help putting together pitch decks, or if our bosses were stuck on conference calls, if we could go run downstairs and grab them coffee. And so I was there, um, and if any of the parents on this call are work in finance, like, you know, I was using, which is a big no-no, I was using my mouse, I typed with four fingers, and I still do, like a dinosaur. Um, and uh, I wasn't very good at the, the financial part of the job, but I was a team player because my first job was babysitting and tutoring. And hey, I still do that now, I guess. But uh, uh, is that he wasn't asked to join the bank full time and I was, and it was all about the attitude. And so these colleges admissions officers, when they're admitting you, even if it's a school like Stanford or MIT, they're admitting you based on what you're gonna be, not just as a student there, but the value you're gonna bring as an alumnus as well. And that attitude check that you get from a Karen, you know, working at Coronado Island during the summer and the food's taking too long, that's just really good life skills. And so I know it's really basic, but especially with this pandemic, which has, I think, really changed the way we interact with each other on a day-to-day -day basis, especially in customer service settings, um, I, I think it's so important, particularly yeah. from communities that are um, known to um, just have certain groups of people that, um, um, are known to be have a little more skew on the entitled side. And this is not me calling out saying Coronado is an entitled place. It's just, it's coastal Southern California. Um, so that's the first factor. And the second two factors, which I think are the most fun as we resume back with normal activities, are passion and, le and leadership. Um, there's no benefit for just being a part of a million different clubs or organizations. A college application is going to have a few short answer questions asking you, what have you done to make your community a better place or how have you been a leader? Those are the two most common questions you get on a college application. And if you're in grades nine, 10 or 11, or you're a senior, but you're gonna be taking a year off, not having an application due in a month, 
um, you have to start asking yourself, what am I going to be writing about in these essays to make the case for admission to distinguish myself from every other high achieving applicant? And the, the thing you do is you can kind of reverse engineer and start thinking about, hey, if these are the experiences that I want to write, that I'm going to be asked to write about, what should I be doing in the community? And we encourage all of our students to engage in experiences that showcase their academic passions and that their ability to lead. Now, you may say, gosh, what 16 year old really knows what they want to do in life? And then I agree with you. And I say this as someone who changed careers twice in my 20s, is that um, uh, you life is trial and error and colleges know this. But if you think you may have an inkling for business or an inkling for healthcare or, or, or engineering, go try to find something on the island in San Diego that, that showcases your ability, your interest in that field. So I have students that say they want to be entrepreneurs or work in business, and I encourage them to go start businesses. I've had students who have, sold, have 3D printed uh, necklaces to raise awareness for uh, human trafficking, and they donate the sales proceeds of the pendants to uh, a shelter. Um, this was a student who went to Pacific Ridge in Carlsbad. She would volunteer at, um, at a shelter um, in San Ysidro for, for people who had escaped human trafficking. Uh, and she, she um, ended up writing her college essay about using modern technology, so 3D printing, to fight the oldest sin in the book. And this was a student that was admitted to Penn, who was admitted to Vanderbilt, who was admitted to UC Berkeley with a full scholarship. So you can get creative on your own. You can join a business club or start a business club at Coronado High or take an intro to business class at Southwestern or San Diego City Colleges. These are the types of things where you can create a story that makes it easy for an admissions officer to understand. And so when we talk about leadership and we talk about passion is let's kill multiple birds with one stone by engaging in activities that are low time commitment and that can fit around all of our other, you know, plethora of things we have to do. And, um, and then also um, help tell the story. So when you are writing about what have you done to make your community a better place or be a leader, you are able to um, tie it to your overall application story and make it easy for them to understand. Um, for students interested in STEM fields, i.e. I want to be an engineer, I want to work in healthcare, uh, there are many programs affiliated with the UC system or uh, for, that are specifically designed for high school research. Uh, that we encourage our students to apply to because uh, what they're looking for on the STEM side is do you have lab or whatever is appropriate for the subcategory within STEM experience uh, within STEM. So what passion and involvement look like are different depending on the type of student. So if you want to go be potentially go to law school and are applying as a political science candidate, uh, you can get engaged and volunteer in a political campaign as a volunteer. Uh, whether it's a local election or a congressional election, there's going to be another campaign next uh, next summer, probably. Uh, no, not probably. There will be. Uh, and um, you can. Um, and we've had students uh, from Coronado Island that have just a passion for history that got involved with the Coronado Historical Society in, in cataloging some of the historical homes. Uh, on the island that are covered under the Mills Act. So there are so many different things you can do depending on what your interests are. And so I know I'm not giving a set answer of what passion leadership look like for every person because that should be unique to you. Um, and I just encourage every student or the parent of student to sit down and ask yourself or ask your child, what is it that you're interested in or what do you wanna go explore? Because if you love it, fantastic. And if you don't love it, you can just cross that item off your list. I never would have gone to law school had I worked for someone other than my dad uh, prior to when I attended law school. And so I, I tell students that exploring your passions and trying to develop your story as a leader is your chance to one, make the case for admission, but two, more importantly, is to figure out where your dire direction is when, you're, uh, when it comes to life. All of these experiences, blend through into the essays. And again, since we've removed the test score from the equation for many schools and for many students in many schools, is that we are really emphasizing with our students 
is focus on grades and the transcript and focus on what your experiences are in high school, because those are the main points that everyone's going to be having in their application. Yes, I said test scores matter for the most selective schools, but um, outside of that subset of call it the 50 schools that, or there's only hundred schools in this country that uh, reject more students than they accept. So for those schools, test scores matter. But across the board, um, we're telling our students is to focus on the, like the, the universal parts of an application that everyone has, which is your experiences that are listed in the activities that you then write about in the essays. And then also your, um, your transcript. I know I'm going quickly um, through this, but I'm trying to provide an overview of how to approach this in a healthy way. I would also like today to talk, because I know there are seniors or seniors that will be applying again, potentially next year, is just some of the um, things that we're also noticing that um, have really changed without test scores this year um, as a result of the pandemic with regard to applying to college. The first is the all important early decision application strategy. Now, for those who don't know what early decision is, early decision means that you apply by November 1st and you find out by Christmas whether you've been admitted to the, the, the school. Not every school offers this. Most colleges, the deadline is either uh, November 30th or January 1st. But private universities and, and some out-of-state public universities do offer what is called early decision, which means you apply early. If you get in, you're contractually obligated to attend. And there, not every school gives a big early decision boost. Schools like the Ivies, uh, there's no boost for it because they get to, you know, pick, they have their pick of the litter with who they want to admit. But there are some schools out there uh, that are a little less selective, but are amazing schools. And schools, in case um, you're wondering for the types of names that I'm referring to, Washington University in St. Louis, Emory, Carnegie Mellon, Tufts, these are all and, and again, I'm not a slave to rankings. I personally don't pay any credit attention to them, but um, uh, is that schools that are at that caliber of selectivity sometimes can give an enormous boost for applying early decision. And if you want to go to a very selective university without a test score, that is our advice to our students for this year, is that, uh, if you do not have a test score that meets Carnegie Mellon's average and you're really interested in studying computer science there, uh, you kind of, what we're seeing from our results from last year is that schools at that level are requiring, uh, you would need to apply early decisions to stand a chance to be admitted without a test score to a, a university like that. I know I'm mentioning a lot of different things and an early decision can sometimes be the most confusing part of this process, particularly for parents. So feel free to put a message in the chat and I can elaborate. I just don't wanna belabor a point that's not of interest to anyone that's in attendance today. But um, uh, what I would say is um, with respect to early decision, the UCs, the UC system, the Cal States, they do not offer early decision. Um, schools like the University of Southern California, there's not an early decision. But this is particularly for a lot of students that say, gosh, I, my dream is to go to Northwestern, it's to go to Harvard, I'm gonna apply ED there because it has a, a slightly higher acceptance rate. That higher acceptance rate reflects the fact that athletes and mega donors have to apply early decision to be admitted. And um, that you would, um, that, 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 and so it's not necessarily a higher acceptance rate for a normal applicant at those schools. <laughs> there are other schools that give huge boosts. Um, so, it just depends on which school you're applying to. It, uh, again, I, I received a question, is that um, highly selective schools, some very highly selective schools, you can go from a 5% chance of admission to a 40% chance of admission, but it's just not an Ivy or a Stanford. It's kind of the next set of schools down. And some of these schools are you know, incredible options um, depending on your particular academic interest. The liberal arts schools, uh, the Williams, the uh, Amherst, the, the middle bears of the world, huge boost. The Claremont schools, huge boost. But um, the Ivies, no. And then for the, if you're just focused on the UCs and Cal States, this doesn't even apply to you in general. Um, 
Other things worth mentioning um, is that um, with respect to uh, merit scholarships, we saw that some of our students last year, historically merit scholarships have been very strongly correlated uh, to test scores, but we did have many students this last year earn admission and earn significant merit scholarships. Uh, so uh, without um, test scores. So what I would say is if you're not submitting a test score, you can still earn a merit scholarship in this new pandemic world uh, as well. Um, so you, you have that as well. Um, and I think that's really important to understand. I'm going to open it up. Those were th those were the main points I wanted to cover in today's talk, uh, which is, I would say, what what are we seeing on the pandemic side as it relates to admissions and what's it, what's um, how it's affecting things, and then two, um, how to make the most of it. Um, maybe I'll belabor one point on the essays because I didn't really cover it. I did mention that all of the activities and experiences flow through in the essays. Um, if you are a senior or a parent of a senior and application deadlines are you know, within six to 12 weeks from now, depending on where you're applying under what application program, the most important thing a senior can do at this point is write an essay, an authentic essay that demonstrates one's ability to add value to a college. And this is not, I'm gonna go, you know, plant you know geraniums in front of the wall um, with the sign that with, where, where you know it says the school's name this is what kind of person are you and how have you grown in high school based on the experiences you've had and that is how you demonstrate perspective for everyone in attendance today i'm going to be putting two chapters from my book earning admission into the chat let's see if i can make this work um let's see if that works that covers the essay writing process just to see sample essays. Oh, why is that not working? Um, we do okay. have his book here at the library um, oh. if you'd like to check it out as well. Okay, I am going to try to attach it into the, the chat as well. Um, is it letting me do that? I don't know if I have, oh, that's because I'm everyone, sorry. Now I can start, give me one second. I'm gonna put it in so you can just download those two chapters. But yes, the book's at the library, which makes me really proud because that's, um, I think that's where I started learning how to read. Uh, so, um, gosh, let me see if I can do this, sorry. Why is it not working for me? You know, if you email, Info and earning admission will send you the two chapters from my book if you want it. Um, I apologize. I'm really, really tech challenged, like I talked about with my banking experience. Uh, so you can email us uh, and we'll take care of that. Um, but the essay is where you make the case for admission. So as I'm saying this on September 16th, 2021, speaking to a senior, the most important thing you can do right now is write the most persuasive essays that showcase the type of person you are because that is how you're gonna demonstrate your ability to add value to a college. And um, you know, for seniors right now who are living or parents of seniors who are living through the hell of what is the modern process of applying to college, uh, there's a lot of essays that you have to write. And um, you know, there's the main personal statement, but then there's also supplemental essays. And we encourage our students to, um, to I find overlap with prompts and reuse and repurpose the highest quality writing to avoid spinning your wheels and starting over from scratch with every essay. Feel free to ask me questions on that as well. Now, we did get a question about when applying early decision, are you committed to going if accepted? Now, let's say you apply early decision to, let's just throw out a name of a school, um, Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt, if that Vanderbilt admits you, you have, uh, I think it's 72 hours to say, yes, I accept your offer of admission. And uh, if I do accept that offer of admission, I am contractually obligated to attend that school and withdraw my applications to all other universities. 
Or you can say, no, I decline the offer, poof, it goes away. Vanderbilt, bye-bye. So you're not technically committed. You do have to affirmatively accept it though. Early action is the other early admission plan that doesn't provide as much of a boost that is non-binding. And that is typically a way just for schools to boost their number of applicants. So early decision, you're committed. Early action, it's the same deadline, November 1st, but you're not contractually obligated to attend. You can leave all of your, you can wait till all of your other offers come in and see where to go. The reason why early decision allows you to say no is because you're gonna get your financial aid offer with your, if you're applying for financial aid and you can say, hey, I can't afford this. So no, it goes away. Great question. Do supplemental materials like arts portfolio help if they are strong? Um, arts portfolios can help particularly for an arts major. Uh, so it, it, a portfolio is often required if you're applying to an arts program. Um, some colleges, uh, particularly the private ones, allow you to upload a submission of a, uh, a music sample or an art sample as a PDF. Now, admissions officers are not necessarily the most qualified arbiters of artistic achievement, but they have the ability to forward to arts professors or music professors and see if these students would potentially be good fits. So they can only help, but in my experience, it is impossible to quantify. We've had students that are incredible artists that had a lot of, they were very, uh, at a lot of conviction in their thought that they would be admitted to a school because they were submitting an art portfolio and it didn't overcome or compensate for other issues, i.e. you not having a strong enough test score or grades or resume, but they can only help. So if you are uh, saying COSA and you're just very passionate about the arts and that's part of your identity, you should submit it. Just don't bank on it being what will carry the day. Great questions. Any other questions? Um, I'll give, I, I just wanna say a few things then um, if there aren't any other questions and feel free to, to ask uh, if there is. Um, the first is that high school I think is become much more stressful and applying to college has become much more stressful than it was when I was doing it 15 years ago or if you're the parents on this call, way more stressful, way more competitive. Uh, these schools that, that if you're a parent on here today, that you may have attended, whether that's UC San Diego, or let's just throw, I have a lot of parents, uh, who say, I went to UCLA. I want my kid to go there. It's not the same school. Um, when I applied to college 15 years ago, uh, I'll be the first to admit UCLA was my backup. Uh, there just wasn't that many people applying. If you had a certain GPA above a 4.0, it's like, you could just cakewalk it in. Um, and that's true, like if you look at um, like George Bush, who graduated from Yale, he had a 970 on the SAT. And I know that he was a legacy and everything, but um, that dog would not hunt today if, uh, if he was applying. Um, and so um, I think one thing is to recognize if you're a parent that this is just a fundamentally different process than it was when we all were applying. And that, um, and that high school, I think is just a lot more pressure on kids today than it was when I was there or um, when any of the, the, uh, the other adults uh, were there. And I think it's just, let's treat this as an opportunity to be very kind to ourselves and to our kids and just encourage them to do their best. Um, I see one student, or at least her face on this, so I'm gonna be speaking more to you, to your little pixel on my screen is that uh, um, where any of us or where you go to school does not have a monopoly on your path to success. My best friend from Penn uh, has never had a job and he has two Ivy League degrees and he doesn't need to work and that's part of the problem, but he is incapable of getting something meaningful. And um, where you go to school is not who you will become. I think it's really important as part of this process to ask ourselves, what are we passionate about? What are we good at? And where will the opportunities in the future lie for us? And how can we tailor and craft our education to, to you know, achieve the goals we want. And the only thing I want for my students is for them to be healthy, happy, and financially independent adults. 
and that doesn't require the most prestigious or the most selective university. I had better job prospects coming out of an unranked law school that was brand new uh, than coming out of the, the top ranked finance program uh, and striking out at, every, at almost every bank that I interviewed at. And so um, I speak from my own experience that I've never found um, the, the, the prestige of a university to be the deciding factor. And I think what this process should be about is learning how to advocate for ourselves and develop the skills and perspective we need to power us to success. Yes, going to a fancy schmancy school can open up an incredible alumni network for you or for internships. But regardless of where you go, you, all of our students are in the driver's seat to make the magic happen. And that's why I think this is such an awesome process is because if you have a healthy mindset and adopt a growth mindset, you can make incredible things happen as part of this process, more importantly, what comes after it. So I wanted to say thank you to everyone that um, logged in today to hear my uh, spiel and uh, about college admissions. And I'll, I'll stick around for a few more minutes. I don't care if you have anything that you'd like to add or, um, but I just, I think there's a lot to be excited about. And I just wish everyone just, you know, the utmost luck and success in this process. And I'll just put my, our website in the chat if anyone wants more information um, um, about who I am uh, here, but, um, and then you can also email us for the, the two chapters on essays uh, if you're so inclined as well. But Tara, I'll turn it over back to you. Well, I think we had one more question for you that just popped in the chat about taking APs. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so you don't have to take every single AP test uh, or class that's offered at a high school. Uh, colleges are looking for passion and commitment to areas that are relevant for you. So if you're a STEM student, what they're going to be looking at for is did you challenge yourself in STEM related fields versus a humanities student. So I've had a student that took one AP class for senior year, which was AP comp sci because she wanted to study computer science and she's now in her third year at Yale. So that's one AP. And I've had students who've taken all APs junior and senior year and struck out at, 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 the, at schools of that selectivity rank. So um, AP classes matter for the story. Uh, and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't focus on is the, am I taking too much? Uh, you only take four class. I only took four classes per semester at Penn. And I think it's kind of crazy that there's this notion that you have to take five or six AP classes as a high school student when your body and brain are less developed and um, you have all these million of other activities that you just, no one's as engaged in college. You're just, you're out having a little more fun and, uh, and, uh, and not doing a million clubs and sports and stuff like that. Hopefully you're going to the gym and avoiding the freshman 15 though. <laughs> yes, this is all very sound advice. Thank you everyone for attending and thank you most of all, Greg, for all your information. Um, we can wait a few minutes to see if anyone else has any questions. Um, I know Maria, your chat wasn't working. So if you have any questions that you wanna hop on the mic for, feel free. Um, no, I don't have many any questions. I did really like your last message, though, to the kids because it is. I feel stressed. I can only imagine how they feel. Um, just to give them that inspiration that it's not the end of the world. There's be more to look forward to. Um, and I also, I know you noticed. I noticed you send your email address so we can email you. But if my son had more individual questions, are they able to reach out to you? Um, yeah, I mean, you are able to retain us for advice. And so all the information on what that looks like is uh, on our website, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, and, um, and I think just to your point, Maria, is like, this is just the beginning. So I think sometimes there's a lot of group pressure and group think at high school, um, especially at schools that have a very high achieving student body like Coronado uh, High. Um, and so I just think it's incumbent on us, parents and the adults in the room to just really like, it, it metastasizes at school. So uh, please um, just reiterate that and emphasize that at home. And, um, and the more people that talk this way, I think the more we can just ratchet down the pressure. Thank you for all your awesome advice and I'll stop the recording.